God's word, faithfully preached, is his comprehensive equipment for changing lives, delivering them from the shackles of sin, the flesh, and the world, and transforming them into useful vessels through whom Jesus can pour out his blessings. Living Seed invites you to a feast of the truth as God's servant brings to us the word of life. We're going to begin by examining uh, the book of Ephesians and we read chapter 4. Now, let me say that the book of Ephesians, right from chapter 1 uh, to the end of it, uh, is a very critical epistle that was focusing on the kind of church that the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for. Now, the efficient church, uh, especially this epistle, was written from a height, the height of the revelation of what God actually wants the church to be. In the efficient church, uh, Paul was dealing with what is the biblical standard, what is God's expectation for the church? <clears throat> what is it that God had provided for the church? And how does God want the church to operate? So you see from chapter 1, uh, Paul was writing, and I wanted to say, let's quickly do a general panoramic analysis of that book before we come and settle on to what will be the essence of growing the church. Now, in chapter 1, you will see Paul, say Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, is writing to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So you will see that the letter was addressed to which people? To saints. Saints. Now, I'd like to say to you that in God's mind, saints are not those who have died. Even though for many times, it's only when somebody is dead that we now say St. Augustine's Church or St. Christopher. But biblically speaking, God recognizes those that have been born again, that have been uh, delivered from the life of sin, he calls them what? Saints. Now that already shows what does God uh, look for in the church? Uh, the church is not, maybe that's the first definition we need to note. The church does not include those that have not personally given their life to Jesus Christ in repentance. Now, even though as years went back and the church backslid, there are many, many people in our churches now that do not have the testimony of when they became born again. Many, many members in our churches that we cannot call them saints because they've not been delivered from the life of sin. So many times we, we, we have mistakenly lumped everybody together and we have called them church. And maybe that's the beginning of the problem of growing the church of God. You cannot grow what was not born. Do, do you understand? 
until someone is born again, he has no capacity to grow. And until someone is properly born with the correct life, no matter what you are doing, you are not growing him. You are only servicing something that will still perish. So when we take the book of Ephesians, which is the book that is speaking into the biblical New Testament kind of church, it is clearly defined that these are saints. These are faithful in Christ Jesus. You will notice that he said, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. They are the faithful in Christ Jesus. May I again quickly say, before we go ahead, that the New Testament church, honestly, is not denominational. Mm, just relax, don't worry. I'm not talking against your denomination. I just want you to first understand something so that when we talk about growing the church of God, we will know what we are going out to deal with by the grace of God. He said, to the saints which are at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is a place. Are you understanding that now? Ephesus is a place. So, when God is talking about the church, he's talking about all the saints, those that have repented, those that have given their life to Christ, those that have been delivered from the power of darkness that are living where? In Ephesus. Do you, do you understand now? So, if we are looking at the saints in Umtata, for example, we'll be talking about all that have given their life to Jesus Christ, who have become born again, and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, who live in Umtata. So, they may be now, now with our nomenclature that is based on names. They may be in the Anglican communion. They may be in the Methodist. They may be in the Assemblies of God. They may be in the Methodist. They may be in the Pentecostal uh, movement. They may be anywhere they may be. But as far as God is concerned, the church of God in Umtata will be all the saints that are living in this area. Do you understand that now? So as far as God is concerned, and I want you to bear that in mind, so that when we go ahead, later on in this book, you will see what God is saying. The kind of thing that God actually is asking us to build. But you see, as we sat here today, and our brother was announcing that there are 52 different denominations that are sitting here. What does that strike to you? It shows that, honestly, you know, we all went, we ate together. Have we eaten together? Eh? And if possible, we slept, you know, together. Isn't it? And we are singing together. Is anybody sick that we are singing together here? Eh? Now, what it means is that denominationalism is artificial. That thing that divides the church of God into little, little, little denominations say, what is your own name? Where do you come from? Which denomination do you belong? It's artificial. It's not real. What divides us is not real. What binds our lives together is more authentic. And if we are going to begin to grow correctly, the church of God, we've got to begin to understand that the church that God wants to grow under our hands 
is not a, de, a, a, a fragmented church. Hallelujah. It's not that which divides in between the flock. So, the church that uh, we're going to be studying from the book of Ephesians, we're noting that number one, they are saints which are located at Ephesus. They are the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, I would like you to please note one word that will be recurring as we look at the book of Ephesus gradually. You will see one small preposition that is going to be recurring, and it's a small word, in. You will see the word in as we are going on. Now, what makes that preposition very critical is that there is no church outside Christ. A person who is not in Christ is not in the church. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying now. It is only as someone is in Christ that he is in the church of God. All those that are not in Christ, they are not of Christ. I hope I'm not confusing you. Are you getting me? All those that are not in Christ Jesus, they are not of Christ. And they are not in the church. They may be in the church building. Are you understanding? They may even come to Christianity. But they are not members of the church because they are not in Christ. Only those that are in Christ. So the Bible said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's only when somebody is in Christ. So actually, when we begin to talk about being baptized, actually we are talking about not just being baptized into water. So no, don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, So church only begins when someone is in Christ. So when we say, oh, our church membership has increased, our church membership has grown, and we're simply talking about those who attended church, we have not got it right yet. Church only grows when somebody is in Christ. That somebody just attended a meeting does not increase the church as far as God is concerned. What only grows the church is when this man has been brought in to Christ. And we will see how do we mark those that have come into Christ. Because that is the beginning of what defines the church. Now, you will see in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. Are you, are you understanding that now? All the blessings that the Father has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, may I again say that the church, which is the people, one by one, who had come into Christ by repentance, who have been baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, and be brought into communion with God, 
the Bible said to them, God has blessed them with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So may I begin to say that God, please listen, I want you to be listening because I'm laying general foundation now and unless we have that critical understanding, we will not know how to actually labor as we are going from here. And yet we need to labor to grow the church of God. We need to labor to grow the church of God effectively, especially now in our own generation. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of departure from the Bible. But God in this end time is going to restore his church to biblical uh, practice. There's going to be a restoration to Bible by the grace of God. Amen? Now, I want to quickly say that the church of Jesus Christ, those that are in Christ Jesus, is not destitute. I would like you to know that actually every local church where the people are genuinely in Christ has been blessed with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Which means any correct congregation of God's people that are in Christ Jesus, if you look very well in their midst, God has blessed them with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus by which they can grow. Do you understand what I'm talking about? There is something that God has provided in his church that can make his church to do what? To grow. All the spiritual gifts, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places have been packaged in Christ Jesus for us. So may I quickly say that the church of God's desire is not a destitute church. It's a triumphant church. What I'm saying is this. Even in the local congregation where you are, if the people that we're talking about have been brought into Christ, you know, I have tried to explain that, but I wish I could repeat it. Many people think that you become a church member because your father is a member of the church. Is that correct? Eh? Some say, well, I'm an Anglican because my parents are Anglican, so I'm a, I'm a Christian. No. Church membership, the correct church, is not hereditary. Every member had to be born again before he can become a member of the body of Christ. Even though you are a pastor now, your children, they are not automatically members of the church. They must be born again. And it has to be something that has happened in their hearts. Oh my God, are we together? Yes. And only those that are born again by the Spirit of God as they were baptized into Jesus Christ, they are the ones that had the capacity to grow. And they are the ones that have what it takes to edify the local church. But all such people that were so born again and they have become members of the body of Christ by being baptized into it, they have all it takes. In fact, there is not one single member of the church that does not have something that is very, very potent and very important to build the church. So if we are going to be growing the church, the first thing is that we are not looking outside the church 
for what to grow it. Oh Lord. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, what what it the order it takes for the church to grow is where? Is inside it. We are not looking for something external. We actually don't need any of the business psychological methods to grow the church. The church will grow if all that has been put inside of it is allowed to function. Your church can actually grow and grow strong and multiply if each man, each woman that God has placed in there, he's been given the correct atmosphere in which to break forth. Do you understand that now? Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. Do you follow me to that point? Hallelujah. Now I said, church, you don't belong to it by heredity. It's not hereditary. Hallelujah. You are not a member of the church simply by marriage. I'm sorry. We need to redefine what we are learning. Even though somebody may get married, if he is not already in Christ Jesus, his marriage does not increase the church. And in that your husband is a, is a man of the Holy Ghost and you are married to him does not make you a member of the church until you are personally born again. Do, do, do you understand that now? So I have said even though we expect that our church is growing because our children have multiplied. But you also know now that the fact that somebody now has 10 children, God bless you with 10 children, does not mean that, that all those 10 children are now members of the church. No, until they are born again, they are aliens to the body of Christ. They are your children, but they are not God's children yet. Oh my God. Am I confessing somebody? Now this is important. What exactly is the church? Those that have been redeemed from the power of darkness and from the world and have been brought into Jesus Christ. And the word is that they have been incorporated in, that is they have been baptized they have been soaked into Christ. And if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things have passed away. So, in Ephesians, having begun to train what the church should be, Brother Paul went on to note that and all the members of the body of Christ or the members of the church they were people that have been redeemed through the blood. Is that okay? Our redemption is what? Is by the blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So now, why am I emphasizing that? I want to note that a correct church only is for those men and women who have experienced redemption. 
excuse me, redemption not by payment. Oh, please take note of this. That we are redeemed. You know that we are redeemed not of corruptible things like silver or gold. You know, there was a time in which some particular denominations were beginning to charge penance. You pay some certain amount of money, then you are redeemed from your sins. No. The correct church is not one that their membership is bought by money. It is not how much a member contributes that makes him a member. They were redeemed by what? By the blood. Not of the corruptible things like silver or gold. We were redeemed by the incorruptible seed of the word of God and by the blood of the Lamb. The forgiveness of our sins is by the blood. So, the church, when we are growing the church, we must be looking at people that have been redeemed from the life of sin by the blood. Not by tears. Please take note. People may cry when they come under the conviction of sin, but it is not their tears that redeems them. There are churches where they emphasize the fact that you have to weep so that you can be saved. May I say to you that a biblical church does not depend on those who can weep their way to be saved. Our redemption is by the blood of the Lamb. And all those who have not experienced the forgiveness of sin by the blood, honestly speaking, they have not been forgiven yet. Because the Bible says, even if you wash yourself with Aesop and with soap, your sin will still be before me. The reason is because nothing else can wash away my sin except the blood. You remember the song we sing, what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other found i know nothing but the blood of jesus only the blood god said when i see the blood i will pass over you redemption by the blood Redemption not by any form of sacrifice. It's not by any other ablution. It's not by washing. It's not by going to bath by the riverside. Because all of those things don't deal with sin. It's only the blood. He said, where there is no shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Are we together? And I want to know that the blood that brings redemption, again, is not the blood of bulls. It's not the blood of goats. It's not another going back to slaughter an animal and say, okay, it is for, it's the sacrifice for sin. No. The sacrifice for sin is finished. The Passover lamb had been slaughtered, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that all those who believe in him, they will no longer perish, but they will have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Now, to grow a proper church, these are fundamental issues that has to be taught regularly, 
everybody has to be confronted with it. As they're coming, they must be confronted with that truth. Otherwise, they can just clog the church membership, but they will not allow the church to grow. One of the things that has hindered church from growing is that we have so many dead tissues in our members. Do you understand? Dead tissues. Those who have no connection with Christ at all. Those who have never shared his life. Now they are interlocked. And all the time, they sap the energy of the church and bring it down. Now, I'm not saying, please take note now, I'm not saying that we may not have such persons that have entered into the congregation. I am not saying we are not going to have the mixed multitude in any of our congregation. Honestly speaking, there may be never a congregation where you will not have a mixed multitude. They must always be there. Actually, the Bible says one time God was having a meeting with his children and Satan also was in attendance. So we cannot rule out the fact that they will come in there. So may I say, a correct man of God who understands that yes, there are such persons, you must never finish preaching any day without giving opportunity for such persons to make their life right with God. You must not give them an assurance that they have already settled. You should not employ them as church officers when you are not sure of their personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you do that, you immunize their heart. You give them an impression that they are already saved. That's why you are using them. That's why you are collecting their money. That's why you are, you are, they are now chairman of a building committee and they are members of the parochial council of the church when they are not born again. Now, I also want you to know, verse 11 of chapter 1, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you had the word of truth. So now, how does people, how does a person come into the life of the church there's only one way. It is by the word of truth. Please take note of this. It is by what? By the word of truth. So that's why anything else can be done. We can do ceremony. We can dance. But until the word of truth has been preached and as entered into somebody's heart, he will not have a new life. Do you get what I'm saying? Let's, let's take note of it. Let's read James chapter 1. I want someone to help us read James 1. James 1, 17 and 18. Yes. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Verse 18. Yes, sir. Of his own will. Of his own will. Begat he us with the word of truth. What did he use to begat us? Eh? Now, thank you. Can you read it from NIV? Read verse 18 for me from NIV. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. 
He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Yes. That we might become the first fruit or a specimen. So may I say there are two things I want to say there. That it is by the word of truth. Please get me now. You know why I'm doing this? You are pastors. And God is expecting you to go and grow for his church. Isn't it? Now, And we need to understand what our implement. He chose to give us new life by the word of truth. It is only as the word of truth is preached by the gospel that people can get the new life. Please tell, listen to me. It is not by telling the stories of how you went to Los Angeles. You know, sometimes you go on your pulpit instead of preaching the word of God, instead of preaching the word of truth, you are telling stories. You are telling folk tales. Folk tales. They don't have capacity to give new life. They can entertain people. They can make them laugh. They can make you very exciting to them. They may even love you, but they will never have the new life. The reason is because the seed, the seed that produces the new life is the word of God. And until God's word is thoroughly preached, deliberately preached, intentionally preached, you don't expect new life. He chose to give us new life by the word of truth that we might be the first of his new creation. That we might be a specimen among men. Is by the word of truth. Let's confirm still. Let's confirm still. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1, 22 to 25. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What purifies a man's souls? Is by obeying the truth. Go ahead. Yes, sir. For all flesh is as grass. Uh -huh. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Yes. The grass withers, and the flower thereof fall away. Away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Uh huh. Do you see that now? So, for anybody to be purified, it will have to be by the truth. Are you hearing me? The washing of water that purifies the church is the washing of water by the word. There is no other thing that gives life to God's church if it is not the word of truth. There is nothing that cleanses the people's lives and purifies their souls apart from the word of truth. And there is nothing that increases their capacity to be fruitful 
except by the word of truth. Every other thing will fade away, but not the word of God. And he said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Are we together to that point? Oh. So what does that imply? It implies that unless the word of truth is presented to people, there is nothing that can give them the new life. That's number one. Unless the word of truth is presented to the people, there is nothing in their hand that can purify their souls. Please hear me. You will notice that I have not talked about prayer. Eh? May I say to you that prayer is great, but prayer cannot save souls. Prayer is not the seed that brings the life. We may pray for people so that they can be in an atmosphere where their life will change. But what changes them is God's word. That is why you could even have prayer group, prayer houses. And people are going there to pray for me, pray for me. They go from morning to night. They can go to the mountain. They could go to the riverside praying. That will never save them. So unless the word of truth that is the incorruptible seed that gives life. Are you getting me now? So if we pray for people and we do not give them the word of truth, they are not going to heaven. So you can see what has reduced the growth of the church when God's word, when the word of truth is no more giving the centrality in his ministry. And if we are talking about growing the church of God, we must understand what is it that grows it. So that we know how to apply ourselves to it. Are we together to that point? Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, look at Jesus himself. In John 15, I think in verse 3, he said, You are clean by the word that I have spoken to you. And in John 17, he said, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. You cannot say, Oh Lord, oh, I, I just prophesy to these people now, you are sanctified. You are sanctified. No. Prayer cannot sanctify sinners. Your laying of hands cannot sanctify them. The only means by which they are clean, the only means by which their souls are purified, the only means by which they are sanctified is by the washing of water, water by the word. It's as the word of truth is preached. That's the only thing that changes people. So Brother Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for the gospel is the power of God for changing men. So to grow the church, the seed that grows the church has to be cast regularly. 
regularly. It should be central. All other activities in any church should be secondary. If you want to see church that is vibrant, that is growing, that is breaking forth. Chapter 1 verse 13 is that in whom you also after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you have believed, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I'll be speaking about the seal of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the stamp, is God's stamp over the church. And as a stamp, it's also a seed over every believer that has come to Christ. Hallelujah. Now, when we, now I want you to please relax, hear me very well. The Holy Spirit for the church is not for the Pentecostals. It's for every man who has been brought into Christ Jesus. Every soul that has come into Christ Jesus, the seal by which God seals them for heaven is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of promise. So, for the church to grow, it is not a selective doctrine to say maybe we believe the Holy Spirit. No. The Holy Spirit is God's seal for every man that has come to believe. And so, in all our churches, we must also expose every member to that seal of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. When I come back, I will be dealing with how did they do it in the New Testament? How did they do it? For example, you will notice that as soon as Peter preached and 3,000 were saved, you know what he told them? He said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized. He was talking of water. And you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that all of them, he was telling them that they will receive the Holy Spirit. When Philip went to Samaria, and having preached and Samaritans repented. Do you remember? He baptized them in water. But then what did he do? He sent to Jerusalem and said, let the apostles come. Because Samaria has received the word of God, they should come that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm talking about now? So as the people have received Christ and they have been baptized, they never thought the sacrament had finished. They knew that the next sacrament to seal their salvation, to seal their growth, is the Holy Ghost. But you see, many of our members, we have, we have preached to them. They have received, you know, the word of God, some of them, by the grace of God, are born again. But they are, they are, you have not shown them the seal. The seal. And you know, when somebody has been sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll find that he will run. He will have capacity to do well. But you know when the devil came to attack the church, he first attacked the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. And gradually replaced the ministry of the word of God with ceremonies. He first of all, you know, we never knew he was doing something. He first replaced it with prayer. So you see, People say, we are praying, we are praying, we are praying, we are praying, we are praying. But you see, prayer without the word of God is without content. It's, it's vague, it's empty. 
Then the next thing the devil quickly attacked is the seal of the Holy Spirit. Now there's no way we can grow the church. And you know I've told you that this is not a matter of denomination now. This is the church. The Anglican, the Methodist, the Baptist, the, the Dutch Reform, all the groups, the Pentecostal, the Assemblies, and all of them, this is what makes them the church. And all of us are going to make commitment to say, Lord, the implement for growing your church, I will not lose it from my hand. Hallelujah. So, now, they were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Is the, is the, is the guarantee. If you read it from other versions, he said it is the down payment. It's the guarantee of our inheritance. We must not be releasing people without a seal on their lives. Now, go to chapter 2, and I would like you to note also something still peculiar about the church, the biblical New Testament church. Something is peculiar about it here. In verse, in verse 8, Therefore by grace are you saved through faith, and not of works, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's, number, that's the next thing to note. That the biblical church, it is by grace that we are saved through faith. Salvation comes not by works, not by human energy. It's by grace. Uh, I must tell you something now. One of the things you may not know that many, many times the gospel of grace has not been taught what most pastors preach is the gospel of legalism. But I want you to know, according to, to, to Galatians, say that we know that no man is justified according to the law. Law, rules and regulations, it may appear nice. It has no capacity to produce a spiritual person. Spirituality can never come by the law. The only thing that produces a spiritual life and a spiritual man is grace. But you know, naturally, we normally tend to legalism. We normally think that people are doing well when we give them rules and regulations. And gradually, 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 we no longer depend on the Holy Spirit in order to grow people's lives. We depend on laws. But the letter kills. Only the Spirit gives life. So a right church that grows where that will keep growing must be a church that grows in grace by the Holy Ghost. Not a church that is just regulated by law. So, a correct biblical church that can grow well is a church that is well founded upon the grace of God. And when we say the grace of God is more than what we normally do at the end of every service, let us share the grace. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with your soul now and evermore. Amen. No. It's more than just a slogan. It's not just a recitation. It's supposed to be a life. The church of Jesus Christ stands in grace. So many, many times we want to abandon the new covenant and go back to the old covenant because it looks very glamorous. It looks wonderful. But it doesn't have the capacity of producing spirituality. So if I'm going to grow God's work, I need to catch all the means by which it grows. Now, the last thing I should say on this before we go away is that every member of the church, please take note, and that's where I'm coming to now begin. Every member of the church is God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Please take note. Every member that have been redeemed they were not brought into the body of Christ for decoration. Every one of them has something particular and peculiar that they should do. There is no one that has been recreated in Christ Jesus only to be an onlooker or to be an admirer or to be clapping hands. Each one of them that have been born again in Christ Jesus, born anew, they were born so unto a good work. There is something every member of, of the body of Christ is meant to do. And it is only as each one of them, are you hearing me, is performing the intended function for which they were born again that the church grows. The unfortunate thing is that most of the churches, maybe about 2% two, two of the church members are the ones running the church. The rest of the church members, they are like wheelbarrows. that are pushed or dragged along. We are already happy if they attended church service. They have never been shown that actually you are created and recreated in Christ Jesus unto a good work. There's something you were born again to do. And it is as each one of them begin to do those good works for which God has prepared them. That's when the body of Christ will be sprouting. That's when every one of it will be working. And then you will see growth. Finally, every member of the New Testament church has equal access to the Father. Hmm, that's a problem. Every member of the church, the New Testament church, has what? Access, equal access to the Father. What do I mean by that? Let's read. Let's read. We are reading chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, before we go ahead. Now, verse 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more what? 
strangers and foreigners. But what are you? Fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, what, I mean, what do we mean by that? Even though as priests and as clergy, are you hearing me? We stand as shepherds, as overseers, but not as lords. Not as owners. Actually, are you hearing me? All these men, they are our brothers. Because your father is their father. Oh my God, are you hearing me now? Okay. And as a result of that, each one of them has a right to go to the father. They have a right to approach the father. And unless we begin to to raise church where every individual member is personally and particularly connected to the head, which is Jesus Christ, we are going to have dead tissues. Because you know what makes your body to function well? Is that every organ of your body has a direct link with the head. Your brain is controlling everything. This finger cannot touch this finger unless a reflex has been sent to the brain and permission has been granted. When you say something, somebody is suffering paralysis, do you know the meaning? What happens is that the segment of the brain that controls this Something got wrong with it. That's why it's like this. That's why if fire is touching you, you will not know. Because the organ that connects it with the brain has cut off. Now, you don't understand what makes our churches to have problem. Because gradually, gradually, and this thing I'm telling you is not just in the orthodox denominations, even in the recent Pentecostals. I found that there are many Pentecostal preachers now that are gradually telling their members that they cannot make it unless they are the ones who bless them. They are beginning to develop membership that cannot have access to the Father. Because they want to feel important. And the implication of that is that you are going to have paralyzed members. Members that cannot function by the instinct of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Members that will have to be carried before they can move. The body of Christ that can grow, every member is vitally connected with the head by the Holy Spirit. So the New Testament church that we are going to be talking about growing, these are the ingredients. Let me stop for this. This has been Living Seed. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036359, 0703-768198. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website 
at www.livingseed.org. Make it a date with us next week.